sport and the world of rugby league is coming to terms with the sad news that the former great britain hooker terry newton was found hanged at his home near wigan yesterday the 31 year old's career was brought to an end earlier this year when he was banned for two years after testing positive for the banned drug hgh our rugby league commentator stuart pike joins me now stuart is so sad and so shocking yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, a, a misunderstood character um, who suffered f- from depression for the last two years. Uh, he, he lost his sister, Leanne, who died a couple of years ago uh, after heroin addiction. And uh, his poor parents were on holiday in Turkey and had to fly back last night when they were told the news. But uh, as a player, he cultivated the image of a, a bad boy, didn't it? Uh, and he loved being the pantomime villain. Uh, the man that opposition fans love to hate but ask any player uh, of this generation and they'll tell you tough and compromising a big heart and he commanded a lot of respect 15 caps for his country two challenge cup wins but lost four super league grand finals and uh, significantly this is a paragraph from his book which came out in the summer in his own words uh, he says if if someone had said to me as a kid you'll win a challenge cup you'll play at Wembley you'll play for Wigan with Andy Farrell and Jason Robinson, your captain Wigan, and you'll beat the Aussies in their own backyard. I'd have taken that. He'd have taken that, and yet what happened seven months ago seemed to obviously bring his world crashing down. Yeah, he, he as you mentioned, he was banned uh, for two years by the UK Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, he became the first man uh, in world sport, uh, Mark, to be caught cheating uh, using human growth hormone and caught via a, a blood test. Um, he joined Wakefield Trinity on a two-year contract after leaving Bradford last year, and um, he just felt because he had so many injuries uh, that he would take the chance. He was told uh, that it, it couldn't be detected and it would help him uh, recover more quickly from injuries. He, he actually uh, bought £150 worth of HGH at a motorway service station from uh, an unnamed uh, player, uh, and he always refused uh, to name uh, the person that he bought the, the drugs off. And I spoke to him back in June, Uh, when his book was coming out and and he was honest and laid bare all his feelings and his emotions. I've done so long obviously being dead against teaching sport and um, I I spoiled that later on in my career. I don't know what's changed my mind over it and you know it's something that I'm going to regret for the rest of my life. Tell us what happened with the with the HGH. I mean reading your book you were you were injecting it into your stomach. Why in the end did you do it? A number of reasons really. I'm not making excuses for what I did, you know, I lost my sister later, uh, earlier on in that year, which may have had effects on, on the way I was thinking. I was wriggling with injuries, and uh, people I spoke, spoke to said, you know, do this, this this could help you with the injuries and further your career, but by no means am I, am I making any excuses for what I did. I made my choice to self and I made the wrong choice. Terry Newton, drugs cheat, that is something that you're going to be labelled with forever, isn't it? It is, yeah, but, you know... Uh, it's something I hope I'm not. Obviously, I know that I am. That's what I'm going to be called a drug cheat. But you know, looking past that, um, I think I've had a pretty, pretty decent career. Four, four grand finals. You know, won Challenge Cups, represented my country, represented Lancashire. You know, captain England schoolboys. I just thought people that you know, I know they might find it hard to see to see past the drug the drugs uh, situation. But I just thought that they can see past that, and I, I think he explained it pretty well in the book why I actually did it. I think if they read the book, they find it pretty understanding why I did it, but obviously they're not going to agree with me. I don't expect them to agree with me. You know, I just hope it can uh, open people's eyes and learn these young players who may be able to go down the path I've gone down, not to do it. What's even more surprising is that you've always been <coughs> vehemently anti-drugs, and, and you touched on your sister who, who sadly died at a, at a young age f- from the effects of, of, of heroin addiction. and. That makes it even more surprising. It does, yeah, but like, at, at the time when I was taking HGH, I was were, I seeing it as a drug. I, was seeing, I see drugs as things what I am, yeah. This was helping me. It was like a medicine what was helping me. I know it was banned and it was the wrong thing to do, but I did it. You can't change the past and I've just got to look forward now and look forward to new things in my, in, in my life. You'll be 33 by the time your two-year ban is done. Are you going to carry on, or, or is this it now? Is it the end of your career? Well, I've recently been contacted by UK Antidoping saying, you know, if I can help them with intelligence, thinking about human growth hormone and 
why people are taking it and why people are going down these paths and you know so if I if I can help you can't it open they've said that you know they'll have a look at my ban maybe a lot to reduce reduce the ban so I could be back, back playing uh, before I know it that last question and that lad last answer Stuart, is very sad and, and, and incredibly poignant how did, how did uh, he obviously didn't think it was the end of his career. How, how did the people within rugby league see? Did they see past as he said he wanted them to? What he'd done? I think so. Yes. I mean, the, the people closest to him certainly did. Um, I mean, one or two of his, his very close friends, Lighten Rugby League and Terry Newton, to to having a, a comfort blanket wrapped round him. And I honestly believe he was totally lost. Um, without the sport, you know, without the routine, without going to training, without playing games. And, you know, he, he, he definitely was looking uh, to play again. He knew his days in Super League were over, but uh, he was quite prepared to, to step down a level to play in the Championship, which is the, the, the level, of course, below Super League. He was keeping fit, um, and he was determined to pull on a, a Rugby League jersey again. He, he actually rang me uh, last month, Mark, to ask the best way of getting a, a bit of publicity to, to promote a poker night in his pub which was featuring rugby league players i mean rugby league and his family that that was his life and he seemed upbeat he was positive and you know he was counting the days to being able to play again and he was being encouraged to do just that by his friends uh, and this morning i spoke to one of his best friends uh, the warrington and england captain adrian morley who like everyone it seems just didn't see it coming absolutely devastating news it was uh, very surreal yesterday i got a phone call off of Brian Carney telling me the news and I just I couldn't believe it then and I still can't believe it now it's uh, it's absolutely horrific all we can presume is that he must have been in a in a pretty dark place yeah it's been quite well publicized that he, uh, he had a few problems with uh, depression last year losing his sister and um, getting uh, his contracts terminated probably didn't, didn't help things and yeah he must have been in a lot darker place than we could imagine because I actually spent a good uh, few hours with him uh, a couple of weeks ago with him and his family and my family and he seemed in great spirits he seemed like the the normal usual Taz I spoke to him uh, the day before uh, the incident on uh, Saturday morning and again he seemed fine you know I wouldn't suspect anything untoward so for this to happen it's like a bottle out of the blue but he must have been um, you know a lot more uh, depressed than, than we would imagine and um, yeah it's such a such a tragedy presumably on on saturday when you spoke to him it was just a, a normal run-of-the-mill chat between mates it was he, he invited me down to his pub there was a charity uh function on at the pub uh would, would have liked to come down even bring the family you know we had other plans so we, we uh we thanked him and, and declined but yeah no it just uh, it seemed just a just a normal conversation, and I didn't didn't, didn't think for a, a million years that anything like this uh, would have happened. So uh, yeah, I just still can't get my head around it. You've been very close, very very close friends for for a long time. The whole thing, well, it, it is just a tragedy. Yeah, it's it's a tragedy, and um, you know I was I was pretty uh, pretty upset yesterday, as you can imagine. Uh, I went down to see his. Uh, his, uh, his father-in-law who, who runs the pub with him and I just I needed a few questions answering and um, Keith Holden was, was great you know he, he filled me in on what was happening but you know um, a bit I've just been looking at some photos this morning actually and uh, just yeah he was it was a larger than life character um, you know he was he was a life and soul of the party and you know at training he had so much energy he was a practical joker and uh, you know it's, I just can't can't comprehend um, you know why this has happened, um, you know, I just want to remember Tez as a, a fantastic player and, uh, you know, one of, my, one of my best mates, not just in, in rugby league, but in uh, in life and uh, he'll be uh, sorely missed. Adrian Morley uh, speaking to me earlier this morning and, and Morley will be one of the three candidates for Rugby League's Man of Steel, the glittering awards night in Manchester tonight, Mark. A, a celebration of the season, uh, but I'm sure there'll be a, a sombre mood and Newton's death will be uh, reflected at tonight's event. Ahead of the uh, Championship Grand Final yesterday, which I was watching on Sky, Barry McDermott, another one of Terry Newton's friends and, and former colleagues, said um, it's a huge lesson to any young lad out there who wants to take a shortcut and find a way to get the edge. It isn't worth it. It's only a game. Um, that was the Championship Grand Final last night. 
and we have the grand final on Saturday, which involves one of Terry Newton's former teams. Yeah, that's right. His hometown club, Wigan. Um, he's always said it, it, it was his team. He he played in, in four grand finals, lost them all. I mean, uh, an endearing memory back in 2003 mm. after Wigan lost their last grand final. Newton in, in, in uh, tears, in bits at the end because he'd, he'd lost another one. Um, the official press day at Old Trafford today ahead of Saturday's showdown and everyone there still visibly shocked and stunned by what's happened. Uh, none more so than close friend Paul Deakin. Uh, the pair spent four years together at Bradford. Tragic doesn't come close really. You know, it's hard for me to speak about it. He was a great mate of mine and he's still not really sunk in. I, I was so shocked to hear the news and still can't believe it's true. You shared a lot of good times, a lot of fun. Car sharing to Bradford and back every day and a real character. Yeah, I still miss them those trips now, even though I'm just around the corner at Wigan. You know, I really enjoyed travelling over with Tez and like you said, he was he was always great fun to be around. You know, always made you smile and you know, a lot of the time took the mick out here which which was him all over and he was a, a fantastic bloke and really great company. Paul Deakin really struggling there, Mark, and the Rugby League has just confirmed that there will be a, a minute's silence to pay respects to Terry Newton before the grand final on Saturday. Stuart Pike, our Rugby League commentator.